Dr. Florence Wong from the Department of Medicine at University of Toronto presents this module that is part of the cirrhosis unit of the fundamentals of liver disease. The title of this module is Ascites. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to click on the button Ask the Forum, where common issues regarding liver diseases are discussed. These are my disclosures. At the conclusion of the program, you should be able to understand the pathophysiology of ascites formation in cirrhosis, understand the various investigations required for a patient who presents with cirrhosis and ascites, and to choose the best treatment option for your patient. Ascites is the most common complication of cirrhosis. It occurs at the rate of approximately 7 to 10 percent per annum. So after the diagnosis of cirrhosis, over the ensuing 10 years, approximately two-thirds of the patients will develop ascites at some stage. Once ascites develops, there is a significant reduction in patient survival so that a patient has only a 56% chance of being alive at five years. So when a patient presents with cirrhosis and abdominal swelling, we need to confirm the presence of ascites identify the possible etiology of the ascites and to assess for complications of the ascites. Here is a list of the basic investigations that we need to do for a patient who presents with cirrhosis and ascites. We need to do some basic blood work including a complete blood count, liver enzymes, liver function and renal function. A complete blood count is required because these patients with cirrhosis and ascites are frequently anemic. We also should look for an elevated white cell count which could indicate the presence of infection. A low platelet count would suggest the presence of hypersplenism. Liver enzymes are checked to look for inflammatory activities in the liver. Liver function is assessed using a combination of bilirubin, albumin, and INR. The bilirubin level assesses the liver's ability to eliminate wastes. The albumin level assesses the liver's ability to synthesize good protein. The INR assesses the liver's ability to make clotting factors. Renal function is usually evaluated using a combination of serum creatinine and electrolytes, especially the serum sodium. Patients with cirrhosis and ascites should also undergo some form of abdominal imaging, be it abdominal ultrasound or abdominal CT scan. Usually by the time the patient presents with ascites, the ascites is clinically evident. But occasionally, we may need some form of abdominal imaging to confirm the presence of ascites. Abdominal imaging will also confirm that the patient has cirrhosis as indicated by nodularity of the liver. Porter hypertension is usually indicated by the presence of splenomegaly and the presence of collateral vessels. Abdominal imaging is also required to exclude the presence of other complications such as the development of a hepatocellular carcinoma. If malignancy is suspected to be the cause of the ascites, then abdominal imaging will also either confirm or refute the presence of malignancy. All patients with cirrhosis and ascites should also undergo a diagnostic paracentesis. A diagnostic paracentesis is required to exclude the presence of spontaneous pa para bacterial peritonitis. If spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is present, then the polymorphonuclear cell count in the acidic fluid is usually higher than 250 
cells per microliter. An elevated cell count is sufficient for the diagnosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. However, we also culture the acidic fluid so that we can identify the offending organism, and also to obtain antibiotic sensitivity. The yield of the acidic fluid culture is significantly increased if we directly inoculate. 10 mils of acidic fluid directly in the blood culture bottles at the bedside. If malignancy is suspected to be the cause of the ascites, then the acidic fluid can be sent along for cytological examination to look for malignant cells. Usually you need large volumes of acidic fluid in terms of liters in order to improve a positive yield. The usual sensitivity for a positive cytological examination, it's approximately 58 to 75 percent. We also need to measure the acidic fluid albumin concentration and the acidic fluid protein concentration in order to help to identify the etiology of the ascites. The serum acidic fluid albumin gradient, or the SAG, is calculated as the difference between the serum albumin concentration and the acidic fluid albumin concentration in grams per deciliter. If the SAG is low, such as less than 1.1 grams per deciliter, the ascites is usually related to either malignancy, infection, or inflammation. However, if the SAG is elevated at more than 1.1 grams per deciliter, the cause of the ascites is usually related to cirrhosis, heart failure, or nephrotic syndrome. He is where the acidic protein count becomes useful. If the SAG is more than 1.1 grams per deciliter and the acidic protein is less than 2.5 grams per deciliter, the cause of the ascites is likely related to cirrhosis. However, if the SAG is more than 1.1 grams per deciliter and the acidic protein is more than 2.5 grams per deciliter, then the cause of the ascites is likely related to heart failure or nephrotic syndrome. I have listed for you here the various causes of ascites in any patient who presents with ascites and you can see cirrhosis accounts for the majority of cases of ascites. Why does ascites occur? In patients with cirrhosis, there is distortion of liver architecture, leading to obstruction to portal flow. Portal hypertension develops. As a result, there is increased translocation of bacteria from the gut lumen into the splanchnic circulation. Many of the bacterial products have vasodilatory properties. In addition, the presence of obstruction to portal flow will increase the shear stress on the splanchnic vessels, leading to the production of vasodilators. The end result is one of splanchnic vasodilatation. Because of upstream obstruction to splanchnic blood flow, some of the splanchnic volume will be transferred via pre-existing portal systemic collaterals into the systemic circulation carrying with it the various vasodilators. Therefore, the systemic circulation is also vasodilated. The capacitance of the systemic circulation is therefore increased. So even without losing any intravascular volume, the body senses that there is insufficient volume in the arterial circulation. This is known as effective arterial underfilling. The physiological response to arterial underfilling is the activation of various vasoconstrictor systems. In an attempt to reduce the extent of the systemic vasodilatation, in addition the various vasoconstrictor systems will also stimulate the kidneys to retain sodium and water in order to increase the arterial circulatory volume. 
some of the excess volume is preferentially localized into the peritoneal cavity as ascites. Therefore, a patient who's got cirrhosis and ascites has an increased total body sodium and water. Therefore, the mainstay of treatment in this patient with cirrhosis and ascites is sodium restriction. In fact, the stepwise approach to ascites management is sodium restriction followed by the use of diuretic therapy. And if sodium restriction and diuretic therapy are not sufficient to eliminate the ascites, then the patient will be assessed for second-line therapies such as repeat large volume paracentesis, the insertion of a TIPS, or consideration for liver transplantation. Let's spend a few minutes talking about sodium restriction. It is recommended at all stages of ascites in order to reduce ascites accumulation. A typical North American no added salt diet contains approximately 100 to 150 millimoles of natural salt in the food items. A patient with cirrhosis and ascites who is not on diuretic usually is unable to eliminate any sodium via the kidneys. And therefore, a patient who is consuming a typical no added salt diet will have a daily positive sodium balance of 80 to 130 millimoles or the equivalent of accumulation of 600 moles to one liter of fluid. And therefore, reducing the oral sodium intake will reduce the amount of ascites that's accumulated. Therefore, patients need to be counseled carefully with respect to sodium restriction and consultation with a dietitian is important. It's helpful to provide diet sheets listing low sodium food items and suggested meal plans. Sometimes patients will also need to be directed to shops where low sodium food items may be purchased. There are now a wide range of literature on how to prepare low sodium meals. Once a patient is on a sodium restricted diet, we can calculate the sodium balance in order to help us to determine whether ascites is going to be stable or going to accumulate. You have prescribed a 2 gram sodium per day diet or 88 millimoles per day. If the patient is able to eliminate 88 millimoles of sodium per day, then there will be no net accumulation nor elimination of ascites. The patient's weight will be stable and the volume of the ascites will also be stable. In contrast, if the patient is unable to eliminate any sodium via the kidneys, then the patient will be retaining the two grams of sodium per day. Then in a week, the patient will have accumulated 14 grams of sodium during the week. If you divide that by the acidic sodium concentration, which is 3 grams per liter, then the patient will have accumulated 4.6 liters of ascites during the week. If the ascites accumulation is more than 4.6 liters per week, then it is likely that the patient is ingesting more sodium than prescribed. Usually, Sodium restriction is only able to eliminate ascites in 10% of all acidic patients. Diuretic therapy is usually required to increase the renal sodium excretion. There are different classes of diuretics and they block the sodium reabsorption at various nephron sites. It is customary to use a distal diuretic such as baronone lactone or amylori and pairing that with a loop diuretic such as furosemide to get a much, much smoother diuresis. The usual starting dose is a one tablet of each 
be it 100 milligrams of spironone lactone or 5 milligrams of, of amylari together with 40 milligrams of furosemide in a one-to-one -one ratio. Patients on diuretics need to be monitored for dehydration due to overdiuresis, renal dysfunction, electrolyte abnormalities, which can lead to hepatic encephalopathy. It has been demonstrated that patients who are placed on combined diuretics consisting of a distal diuretic and a loop diuretic simultaneously do significantly better than patients who are prescribed sequential diuretics such as a distal diuretic followed by a loop diuretic. The use of combined diuretic therapy can lead to quicker ascites clearance, less, the patient is less likely to have treatment failure, and patients are also less likely to run into complications. As mentioned earlier, the usual starting dose of diuretic therapy is one tablet of a distal diuretic together with one tablet of a loop diuretic. Some patients may not respond to the initial low doses of diuretics if the weight loss is less than 1.5 kilograms per week, then the diuretics can be safely increased provided there have been no electrolyte abnormalities or renal dysfunction within the week. In addition, the patient has been compliant with sodium restriction. The recommended increases usually consist of adding one pill of each class every time until the maximal diuretic doses are reached. The maximal diuretic dose for spironolactone is 400 milligrams per day and that for furosemide is 160 milligrams per day. Occasionally, cirrhotic patients may present to medical attention for the first time with tense ascites. It is perfectly fine to perform a large volume paracentesis for patient comfort. Do not forget to give patients albumin with a dose of 6 to 8 grams per liter of ascites removed if the paracentesis is more than 5 liters. Once you've eliminated a large volume of the ascites through paracentesis, the patients can start on sodium restriction and diuretic therapy. Fluid restriction is not recommended. It is not practical and not enforceable. It is only recommended if the serum sodium is low at below 125 millimoles per liter. Fluid restriction will only worsen the underfilling of the effective arterial blood volume and will do nothing to decrease the edema. The use of diuretic therapy together with sodium restriction will eliminate the ascites in 90% of cirrhotic patients. At that time, diuretic doses may be reduced. This is particularly true if the underlying liver disease has been taken care of, such as the elimination of viral hepatitis with effective antiviral therapy or the continued abstinence of alcohol in a patient with alcoholic liver cirrhosis. As mentioned earlier, 10% of patients will continue to have ascites despite sodium restriction and maximal diuretic doses. Such patients are unable to lose 1.5 kilograms of water weight per week while on maximal doses of diuretics for over a week and while being on an adequate dietary sodium restriction. Such a patient is said to have refractory ascites. Patients whose ascites cannot be eliminated because they are developing complications with the diuretics are also said to have refractory ascites. Such patients will need second-line treatment for their refractory ascites be it repeat large volume paracentesis or the insertion of a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic stent shunt, or TIPS for short.
TIPS is very effective in eliminating portal hypertension, which is the basis of the pathophysiology of ascites formation. TIPS is best reserved for patients whose only major problem is one of portal hypertension, and yet there is minimal liver dysfunction. Such a patient, once the portal hypertension is eliminated, will gradually clear the ascites. Such a patient will also have improved survival for a prolonged period of time and therefore may not even need liver transplantation. However, for patients who have some degree of liver dysfunction, the insertion of TIPS may be regarded as a bridge therapy until the patient receives a liver transplant. Liver transplantation needs to be considered in all patients with refractory ascites and significant liver dysfunction as indicated by MELD score of more than 15. Liver transplantation will eliminate portal hypertension, liver dysfunction, and hemodynamic abnormalities. The ascites will resolve slowly as the patient recovers from liver transplant surgery. While the patient is waiting, for liver transplant, we need to do our very best to avoid further complications. We need to counsel the patient to avoid elective surgery, no matter how minor it seems, such as hernia repair. At any abdominal surgery, it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality. We also need to counsel the patient to avoid the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as this may induce renal failure and worsen the control of ascites. Antihypertensive agents also need to be avoided as the significant systemic hypotension can worsen the control of ascites and induce renal dysfunction. Sedatives are also to be avoided as the elimination tends to be reduced and therefore Patients may have prolonged sedative effects, which can induce hepatic encephalopathy. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation, and I invite you to access additional content on liver learning on this topic or any other related topics at your leisure. Thank you.